Panzer Kops of the Kerberos Saga, cut and intimidating figure. Their iconic crimson gaze offers no mercy for their foes. Their full body armour, no opening. Are they a force of necessary justice, of protection, of barbarism or villainy? Or are they all of those at once, and more still, behind their steely veneer? In their alternate history, a history where Japan sided with the Allies during World War II and still lost, invaded instead by a ruthless German occupation, we explore how the special armed garrison of the Metropolitan Police Force fit into such a world, and more importantly, how they don't. Jinro, the Wolf Brigade, is the best known entry in the Kerberos Saga, and at first glance, it may seem like more trouble than it's worth. The third film in a trilogy of films, themselves only the cinematic arm of a franchise that spans comics, movies, and even radio dramas, its intimidating lineage tends to scare off potential fans. Primarily created and overseen by Mamoru Oshii, best known for his adaptation of Ghost in the Shell, much of this mixed media behemoth is difficult to find in English, the rest of it impossible. On paper, it's one of the most impenetrable franchises for a foreign fan to get into. I'm here today to tell you to tear that paper up. Jinro isn't just a standalone feature you're able to enjoy completely divorced from its lineage. It's a masterpiece of modern animation that absolutely demands your attention. Oshii's Kerberos Saga is ultimately about how a country gets to that desperate point where totalitarianism and martial law seems appealing, and about how quickly those rotten band-aids peel off such a gaping wound. As the saga opens, Japan have already realised that giving absolute power to its peacekeepers was never going to end in… well, peace. Named after the three-headed gatekeeper of the Greek underworld, the red-eyed devils of the special armed garrison send plenty of souls to a similar destination. By the time the series started with 1987's The Red Spectacles, they've already been deemed too brutal, too merciless, and too judicial with how their MG42s interpreted the law. A bloodthirsty dog at the end of a fascist leash Whilst his iconic armoured police have long been the poster child of the Kerberos saga, and have seemed to inspire many imitators, they are largely absent in Oshi's vision. Their intimidating presence is shown sparingly, the focus squarely on how their members exist post-dissolution, as the country around them attempts to recover from their reign of terrifying peace. No. To actually walk a mile in those armoured boots, often through the sewers of Tokyo, we had to wait for a fresh-faced director, Hiroyuki Okiura, to explore this world through a thoroughly different lens. Jinro a prequel that lets us see the Panzer Cops in their ugly prime, feels more prescient, more important, and as a result, more uncomfortable today than it ever has. After a year defined by political activism, violent riots and police brutality, the world of Jinro, one that once posed a terrifying what-if, now feels all too close to home. Scenes of walking tanks cutting down rebels, terrorists and political dissidents, to the tune of that terrifying throb, strand viewers in purposeful shades of grey. For Kerberos, however, 
There's no place for moral quandaries, no room for sympathy or forgiveness on the other side of those terrible weapons. Weapons that dole out 1200 rounds of non-negotiable judgement every minute. Our protagonist, Fusei, comes into focus when he forgets that. At the start of the film, he's faced with punching the ticket of a young and seemingly unarmed rebel. He hesitates. <laughs> and spends a movie reckoning with that mistake. The mistake of mercy. The quiet and contemplative Fusei spends much of Jinro weighing up what it means to be a part of such a force, a force that sees not in shades of grey, but red. The innocence, but also the guilt and threat of those perceived enemies has long been at the heart of the series. An overabundance of unnecessary force sparks much of its biggest questions and most weighty narrative beats. But here, in Jinro, it's the lack of force, the danger of underestimating a very real threat that rears an even uglier head. No one is innocent, and as the film descends into its narrative proper, as the insidious and secretive notion of the rumoured Wolf Brigade is uttered in hushed tones, it's impossible to side with anyone, to know anyone, or their true machinations. で、ただ who would go on to become a renowned director in his own right following this debut knew that in such a dark world, you had to have something to root for. As Fusei meets the sister of the bomber and strikes up a friendship with her, a relationship forms that has a dark and uncomfortable heart, but one you can't help but cheer on. In this relationship's quietest moments, as emotionally clumsy as they are visually, Jinro presents a form of innocence that's noticeably absent in the rest of that harsh world. Jinro is a stunning film, an animation that stubbornly championed traditional values, even as the rest of the industry began to move on. Truly, the beautiful visuals push the art form to its limits in wonderful ways, resulting in a film that feels stark, crisp and unique. Its violence, shocking in its brevity, is crunchy and visceral. Descriptors I find myself using less and less, as CGI becomes the standard for action scenes, even in anime. Okiyoda's pictures are defined by the expressive faces of his heroes. This emotive sakuga champions the character of his characters at every turn. He would go on to direct A Letter to Momo, a comedy that hangs off every grimace, and whilst the focus is more sombre in this debut, the strength of that focus still sings. But it's in the picture's cinematography where Jinro's lineage shines through. If you do check out The Red Spectacles and Stray Dog, one thing you'll come away with is an appreciation for Oshi's eye, for framing and composition. These are weird films, especially the first, which straddles an awkward line between moody arthouse noir and slapstick farce. It's a fever dream, a beautifully shot fever dream, but a fever dream nevertheless. Whilst Jinro features none of the series' playful silliness, it's awash in those beautifully composed moments, its brooding visuals constantly playing with light and dark. As the movie progresses, it frames scenes in ways that consistently surprised me, in ways I'd never seen anime shot before, and it speaks wonderfully to the series' roots, 
even as tonally divorced as the picture can seem at times. A few years ago, it received a live-action adaptation. Ilang, The Wolf Brigade, takes the plot of Okiura's classic and transplants it to a career on the verge of reunification. Seasoned anime fans might groan at the notion of a live-action adaptation, but 20 minutes in, I was sure we had an exception to the rule. Sadly, whilst that introduction adapts the classic's stunning opening in truly bombastic fashion, it quickly buckles under a treatment that utterly misses the quiet point of the original. Still, its existence proves, with finality, that Jinro is indeed capable of standing alone from its saga, enough even that it allows the story to be transported to a new country and divorced from its original setup entirely. Also, the Protect gear and those haunting red eyes have never looked cooler, colder, or more terrifying than here, nestled in an otherwise underwhelming movie. Jinro is widely regarded as a classic, but as an animated prequel concluding a series of live-action films, themselves only pieces of a 20-year puzzle. It's often overlooked by newcomers. This is a mistake, and it's a mistake I myself was guilty of making for the longest time. Googling the series can make checking out Jinro seem exhausting, when it's anything but. This is a film that is immediately appealing, a film that is instantly engaging with no prior knowledge of the saga it belongs to and a film that's as enduring as any of the greats. The Wolf Brigade demands your attention, not because of its impressive lineage, but in spite of it. As always, thanks for watching. And whilst I'm at it, thanks for sticking with the channel as it's expanded in new directions. Between larger projects such as the Mother documentary and more experimental videos such as Speed of Lightness, things have been a bit different here over the last few months, but fantastic anime like Jinro will always be the core of the Beyond Ghibli experience. I'd like to thank my patrons, who enable me to chase such strange horizons. If you'd like to help me delve ever deeper into the topics I cover, please consider pledging a buck on the Patreon. Otherwise, you can subscribe here on YouTube, or follow me on Twitter to hear about what's next for the channel. If, instead, you think I should subject you all to a pretentious reading of the live-action insanity of the Red Spectacles, hit the like button, and I'll start really overthinking that naked fight scene.